¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo andan? Eh... Hello. This is my collection of uh, stickers from fraud. I studied graphic design. When I was studying in college, I started developing this hobby of collecting all kinds of everyday, ordinary objects that have no uh, real commercial value, like these stickers, these pieces of glass, uh, the sugar bags. And although I had the uh, aesthetic and graphical interest in these objects, I was really interested in knowing what happened when you collect many pieces of the same type of product. It seemed that they require a new meaning and the, therefore the value was different. I started looking at the objects in a different uh, way. I kept on collecting things. I'm still a collector. And over the years, I worked more with recyclable materials, collecting them and trying to understand how that classification could turn uh, waste into resources. And I was um, very interested in recycling because I found that there was the same underlying purpose. If you look at just one object, it is easy to think about that object as a waste. But when you start looking at many uh, pieces of that waste and you sort it and you classify it with a scale value, our perception of that object will change. A bale of PET materials can have an economic value and it can become a very interesting resource. So I was interested in analyzing what happened from a point of view of scale. As I learned more about recycling and the classification of waste to avoid the waste of so many materials, I also understood the limitations of uh, resources for something that is uh, technically recyclable to be effectively recycled. There, there are a number of steps that need to take place in the chain, which is very difficult. So whenever we recycle, we see that uh, we still uh, recycle a very small amount of materials. So we tend to think more about the materials. We focus a lot on the materials. A lot is being said about plastic. Uh, we demonize plastic. But actually, plastic is a material with given properties. It is durable, uh, persistent. It can be washed. And here you have two plastic containers. Although we have different types of plastic, both of them are made of plastic. And the difference is that one is designed and conceived to be used only once and then be discarded or disposed of. And the other one is uh, conceived as a more lasting uh, container. So the problem in does not have much to, so much to do with the material as it has with the way we use those materials and how we dispose of those materials. We, and we accept the use of a lot of disposable products, so the problem also has to do with that. This is a commercial from the 1950s when the idea of disposable materials was instilled in us. We were presented with these new products, and commercials would make this promise to us that they would spare us time and effort, they would make us happy. Presumably, this would be convenient products after a birthday party. You don't need to do all the dishes. You don't need to refill uh, a bottle. You can just use it and throw it away. And the truth is that we tend to naturalize uh, the use of disposable products since the 1950s. It is almost uh, unconscious for us when we go to an ice cream shop, uh, we get a little spoon, and we buy a lot of food in disposable containers, and we get even to this point. Does it make sense for us to throw away this uh, expanded polyesterine uh, tray with, uh, also with the film material just to save ourselves five minutes that we need to wash and to, uh, and to cut uh, this uh, squash? So that 
a biodegradable container such as the squash may contain all the vitamins of that product. And this is almost like a perfect packaging, and it requires no adjustments. And this uh, fever for what is disposable um, was transferred to many objects. Over time, we consume many, many more products that be turned into disposable products. We are under the impression that uh, products uh, last uh, less time now, and it is very difficult to repair them. It will be cheaper to buy a new one than to repair the old ones. Unfortunately, this is true in many cases. This is a toaster that has no bolts outside. It has a base, so it is impossible to find those uh, bolts to open it up. And in many appliances, we see that that is the case. Many of these objects were not designed to be repaired. There are some appliances that are sealed off. We have no manuals. The manufacturers leave us alone um, the day after the warranty expired, so we are made hostages. And this doesn't happen by chance. This is not an accident. This is not a design error. It has to do with a planned obsolescence that aims at maintaining demand at a certain level and promoting ongoing consumption. Products that used to last for a lifetime now last less and have to be replaced. And when they are replaced, they have to be disposed of. And they are not designed for the proper recycling. Uh, home appliances have millions of different materials assembled inside. And it is almost impossible to recycle them as a unit. So they were not conceived considering the life cycle of these materials. If we look at nature, in nature, there is a perfect circularity. There is no conception of waste. The waste from a cycle can nourish or feed into another cycle. And so there is constant feedback here into a new cycle. But human beings, when we design products and synthesize elements taken from nature and create new complex materials used to make products that are also complex, we break up with that circularity and we introduce a linear model of extraction uh, use um, disposal and the result, uh, the, the output of that process cannot always be find a place somewhere else. So I don't know what your views are on this subject matter, but how is it possible that we didn't envisage that this was going to happen? When those decisions were made, we didn't consider this. How is it possible that now we have this model in place that is so natural to all of us? Sometimes human beings uh, act like this. We have this ability to selectively look at the things that we want to take into account. In nature, you have um, huge levels of interdependencies and interconnections. Uh, the weather, the species, uh, there are very subtle uh, imbalances in nature. And in our way to uh, produce, in, with our current production methods, we tend to oversimplify things, and we don't think about the greater impacts in the future, or we realize um, what the consequences are after the fact. And I have this quote from a Swedish uh, um, scientist who says that we are the first generation who knows that we could be undermining stability and the capability of the Earth to sustain human development as we know it. We know that we are faced with a problem, that we are in trouble here. Anyway, it seems that change are not taking place at the speed they should be happening. Let me give you an example. I'm sure that you all saw these images of islands of plastic material floating on the oceans. And I'm sure that this fills you with anguish and hopelessness. But anyway, when we go back home tonight and when we consider about what we are going to have for dinner, we will go to the supermarket and probably we'll find that almost all the food that we can buy in the supermarket is wrapped 
removed or comes in a plastic container. So there is a reaction that is not taking place there, or at least it is not taking place at the right speed. And there is a term in psychology that describes this, that is cognitive dissonance. This is like a lack of compatibility of two different cognitive systems, two systems of ideas that are opposite to each other. And it is very difficult for us to understand how you see this image of all the plastic on the ocean, and then you go anyway into the supermarket. It's like you ignore one of the options. And all of us place ourselves in a um, place of tension. And I also have this other quote by a U.S. environmentalist, Beth, I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And scientists don't know how to do that. So it seems that the problem lies somewhere else. We have a lot of solutions provided to us by science. The scientific development is incredible, but some solutions cannot be put into practice. It seems that the changes have to start with us. We need to implement a change of priorities. And how can we do that? I'm sure that all of you are asking yourself this. I don't have the answer. I'm just taking with me a lot of ideas expressed here, but let me contribute one idea here. We should question and challenge more our conditions. All of us are conditioned to accept a lot of things as if they were taken for granted. Um, this is the way that we grew up. We are conditioned to the fact that we buy our food in the restaurant, that the food comes in a, this, in a plastic container. We tend to give priority to economic benefit over environmental or social benefits. And this reminds me of a movie from the 1990s, The Truman Show. I hope that uh, if you haven't seen it, I'm not spoiling the end of this uh, movie for you. Truman was born within the context of a reality show. He is born and raised in a big um, filming set. And in the world, in there, is the only one he knows. As he grows up, he starts identifying a lot of inconsistencies. Uh, he fears that he feels that there are certain things that don't make so much sense. So he starts wondering whether the world could be different. And everybody tries to stop him. All the other actors and actresses that interact with him are also employed by the directors of that reality show and try to persuade him of not pursuing those ideas. But uh, one day he reacts and he ventures to go on a sailing boat in, into the sea. And he feels that there is something that is not entirely right in that world. So he uh, sails towards the edge. And I like this metaphor that all of us are a little bit like Truman. We all feel, we all see these signals. There are certain things that are not working properly. We see floods, um, climate change, uh, diseases, poverty that is not being solved with economic growth. So all of these are signals that we are trying to incorporate and, and address. All of us feel very small, and of course, nobody can do it all. We cannot think that only one person can provide all solutions, but I think that all of us can make a contribution, all of us can do something from where we work in our own position. 
designers, communicators, architects, engineers, activists, uh, full-time employee uh, activists or um, freelance activists, all of us uh, from our own places can do something to contribute to challenging this uh, conditioning uh, aspects. I think that that is, we have the responsibility to do so. And we also play a very important role because we are consumers. All of us are consumers, everyday consumers. And perhaps there lies a power that is much bigger than the, that we realize. Whenever we make a purchase, it's like casting a vote to support a specific economic and production model. So there are many more questions that we could ask ourselves before making a purchase. And we can become more demanding consumers. And I'm sure that that will give us a lot of power. And I have a lot of friends and relatives who are always uh, contributing these kind of articles. Look what they do in the Netherlands. They have a free waste store. Everything is organic um, or zero waste um, uh, shops. But this already exists. Uh, this is very old. Uh, in all our neighborhoods, we have shops that sell uh, products in bulk. And the only difference between these and the other shops in other countries is that I have to bring my own container to get it refilled. But I think that there are many things that are accessible to us and that do not necessarily imply big efforts or big changes in us. Just some minor twists, minor adjustments in our mindsets, in our behaviors as consumers. And being a responsible consumer also implies looking after what we have so that these objects can last uh, a long time. When you repair something, there is a dual purpose. You extend the service life for that object, so you avoid the impact of disposing of that object. But we are also avoiding the impact caused by the production of a new product to replace that one. So the, re the practice of repairing um, is, has very concrete benefits, and it allows us to them look after these objects and also natural resources. And it has to do with a generational belief. For my grandmother, it was obvious that uh, things have to be repaired. So um, did my grandfather. They would always uh, repair their own objects, their own appliances. But in my generation, it is a little bit more difficult. We don't know that much. We don't know how to repair. We don't know how to sew. We don't know how to uh, make an electrical repair, how to deal with electricity. So in 2015, in order to do something about this, together with Melina Scioli and Julieta Almorosoni, we ran a test. And we organized a collaborative initiative looking for people who know more about how to repair products um, so that they could be in contact with those who don't have the knowledge and together they could repair many products that perhaps uh, couldn't be repaired through the official channels. Um, the fact that it is more expensive to repair uh, an appliance than to buy a new one doesn't mean that the, that appliance cannot be repaired. So it is important to open up the appliance and make an assessment. So perhaps that is why the job is so expensive. But so we started organizing these meetings of what we call the repair club. And we started convening, calling upon people who are very handy and who know how to repair things and would be willing to help others. And a lot of people got together. And for more than three years now, we have been organizing this kind of meetings. And in this club, we intend to give a new meaning to the practice of repairing, to view repairing as a responsible practice, as a contribution that we can make to change our role as consumers. <coughs> We have been doing this for three years. We still get messages from people asking us what we repair, how we work. And we also ask ourselves that question. Although 
We may repair different small home appliances used in the kitchen, uh, like a blender or garments or bicycles or electronics or toys, books. We also ask ourselves that question, is it the only thing that we are repairing? We feel that perhaps more important than the objects that we repair, we are repaired in this role of uh, ourselves as uh, consumers and our direct relationship with the natural resources uh, that um, are part of these objects. And we also feel that we are also repaired in something in the community because we are creating this space where we can spend time with people we don't know and we get together for a common purpose such as repairing a lamp. So at the community level, we feel that this is extremely valuable. We have organized more than 40 meetings in three provinces across Argentina, also some others in Uruguay, Mexico. We feel that the ingredients necessary to form a repair club are everywhere. We have a website, repair.club, and whoever wants to start a club can do that. So the, those interested could send us a message, and we will provide them with materials based on our own experience. We are not inventing anything new. We are not reinventing the wheel. These clubs exist already in other parts of the world. We have introduce our own uh, characteristics, but we invite you to join us in these meetings. Usually we have one meeting every month. And if you are far away and you want also to organize this kind of meetings with your neighbors, your communities, your schools, or your workplaces, uh, well, we encourage you to do so. And in conclusion, let me share with you these kind of uh, searches. This is the kind of questions we ask Google. What would happen if all people on Earth jumped at the same time? What would happen if all of us ran in the same direction at the same time? What would happen if all of us need the same time? So you can have a variety of questions and also very funny and varied uh, replies. But we like this curiosity. Uh, as a collective group. Uh, we get together and uh, we collect our individual actions and we can have a larger impact to modify the reality we live in. So thank you.